Yes, yes. Okay, Steinberg. great. Thank you. Um, all right, so let me ju just say a couple of things about the colloquium. I hope you all went to the colloquium on Friday. I can wait. No. Well, it was too bad because it was um, it was quite a good colloquium uh, by Emil Matola of Los Alamos. And he was talking about um, gravity and quantum mechanics. And um, he gave a very nice discussion of the basic issues of uh, Schwarzschild uh, metric, the Schwarzschild. Um, so who's just turned it on already? So you don't need to turn it on. Oh, okay. Anyway, so and his basic point was that if you take into account an anomaly that occurs at time, so I'm talking about the the uh, physics program on Friday. Did you go? I was back. Said it was by Emil Matoli, he was talking about gravity and quantum mechanics. And his point is that one needs to include an anomaly called the trace anomaly that occurs in gravitational theories. And that if you do include that trace anomaly, you get a new term in Einstein's field equations, which um, softens the Schwarzschild singularity. Uh, so that was one of his points. His other point, which he never quite made because he ran out of time, uh, even though he went over by 15 minutes, um, his main point was that if you look simply at the universe at large, uh, and look at the Einstein field equations for cosmology and include the short, include the trace anomaly term. That term will have a, uh, a will contribute a scalar field that uh, can explain the dark energy uh, density. And um, what I what I should have mentioned was that he was doing all of this in the context of an effective field theory, whereas you have a field theory that may or may not be normalizable at high energies, but at low energies you integrate out the heavy fields, and at low energies you have certain non-renormalizable interactions, but uh, you just compute with them, and this is what, this is how we got his results. Now, whether he, what he's doing is right or not, I don't know. Well, if you knew it was right, everyone would be doing the same thing. <laughs> All right. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd say that, uh, just give you that explanation. Um, okay. The, 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 the lecture notes about the Casimir effect are on the, on the web page. Um, what I'm going to do now is start renormalization and, and dimensional regularization. And um, I'm following Weinberg. Um, with Weinberg, you get all the key ideas. Um, in other books, you never know. Um, all right. So let me start out, and, and I'm going to do renormalization at least now. For now, I'm going to do it in the case uh, where it's really been perfected, namely. Uh, quantum electron matters, where you can compute things in many decimal places and so on. Um, all right, so the Lagrangian, or the Lagrange density, to be technical, is minus a quarter Fb mu nu, Fb mu nu. Now, what's this B? B means bare. In other words, this is, um, this is the field the way we uh, normally write it. But we don't really know anything about what the right normalization or anything else is for okay. 
We'll anticipate the question. All right, so here's the Lagrange density for quantum electrodynamics um, written in terms of bare fields and bare charges. These are the things that we were using when we did our tree level calculations last semester. And um, we left off the Bayer index, but um, that's, uh, that's um, in other words, if you write the Lagrange, let's put it this way, if you write the Lagrange in this way, you need to say that all of these quantities are mysterious. In other words, in fact, I, I just misspoke. I said, so forget what I've just, what I, the penultimate remark. The last remark is, we write things this way with a B. The B meaning, is telling us that if we really computed the perturbation theory to all orders, we need to have extra coefficients uh, relating these Bs to the simple quantities that we were, we, we've been using that we were using last semester. So for example, psi b is going to be traditionally you write it as square root of c2 psi a b square root of z3 a u e b c over the square root of z3 and then m b is m minus delta m. Now this m here is the physical mass. And E is the physical charge. Okay. Um, Now, this same Lagrangian we can rewrite. And we can rewrite it as. So we're saying that in the physical QED, or in the QED Lagrangian, we don't actually have the physical charge, we have the bare charge. Right. For some same reason that we. Right. Can. In other words, these okay. are, these are, so to speak, the, the variables outside Plato's cave. Okay, all right. And so in other words, these are, these are the true things, and um, we're fooling around with, with, with psi and so forth. Uh, well, let me actually, though, I mean, this, this is the party line on renormalization, and it's certainly correct. But what's really going on is that we don't know how to do physics at very short distance scales. And so something happens at 10 to the minus 19 meters, 10 to the minus 20 meters, somewhere in there, maybe it's the Planck length, maybe string theory is the right answer, one doesn't know. And we're going to sort of hide our ignorance in, in this uh, procedure here. Okay, so we can rewrite this as minus a quarter of course Z3 F mu nu F mu nu minus Z2 psi bar down on mu D mu plus I. Notice that the the EA terms cancel. The Z root Z3 is have been designed to cancel. And then this is plus m minus delta m psi. Okay. So now we're back to our normal fields. And now we can rewrite this one more time. This is all the same one drawn to. So we'll go on density. Minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu And as soon as we write that down, we have to correct it this way. 
In other words, the sum of these two just gives this. And this is the thing that we were playing with last semester. We'll continue to play with it. But then when we get in trouble with infinities, we'll cancel them with this counter term. That's the way the thing works. And then we have minus psi bar What are the constraints on Z2? What? what can Z2 and Z3 be? Like what a... Well, they're going to be infinite. <laughs> but there's some type of uh, infinity or what a... Like what, what are the well, constraints? Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to use dimensional regularization. In dimensional regulars, we're, we're going to compute, we're going to imagine that we're instead of being in four dimensions, we're really in four minus epsilon or some three and a half, 2.5 dimensions or something. In those, for those dimensions, the integrals are all going to be finite. And then we're going to arrange things so that the, uh, we're going to see that as d goes to four, we're going to arrange the counter terms, we're going to choose the counter terms so that the infinities cancel as d goes to four. And, and what happened to z1? What happens to what? <laughs> what happens to Z1? That's a good question. Um, I imagine Z1 was in here, but Weinberg just left it out. All right. Gamma mu V mu plus M psi. You see, there's a typo. And then to correct that, we have the term minus z2 minus 1 psi bar gamma mu d mu plus m psi. And then to correct the delta m part, we have z2 delta m psi bar psi. And then finally, we have the interaction minus i d a mu psi bar gamma mu psi. And then to correct that, we have minus i e z2 minus 1 a mu psi bar gamma mu psi. All right, now another way of writing this is to say that L is L0 plus L1 plus L2. L0 is just the part that gives the free field time dependence. It's minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu minus psi bar d slash plus m psi. L1 is the ordinary interaction term minus i e a mu psi bar gamma mu psi. So last semester we were just dealing with these two. L2 is the part that saves us from the infinities minus a quarter Z3 minus 1 F mu nu F mu nu minus Z2 minus 1 psi bar D slash plus M psi plus Z2 delta M psi bar psi minus I E C2 minus 1 A mu psi bar gamma mu psi. All right. Quick question. Yeah. Are the Z1, Z2, Z3 related to, I'm just trying to remember the line right now, uh, related to the radiative corrections like the yeah, yeah, yeah. vacuum polarization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Absolutely. I think Z1 is 1. I think that's the reason Z1 is not included. Because oh. it's the self energy correction doesn't cause a renormalization constant to come out for the mass. I think Z1 just turns out to be one. Okay. If I remember it right. So. Thank you. You're probably right. All right. So that's um, that's what we've got. Now, it, it's important to keep in mind we only have one Lagrangian. Okay. And that Lagrangian is this one that we write up here in terms of the the mystical variables, all the bare variables. And then we're going to write it now in terms of the free part, the interaction, and all these counter terms. 
time. So what we want to do now is compute what is sometimes written as this. So we've got P going here, P minus Q going there, Q is going this way, so there's a photon line like that. Right, okay. And so this, this is going to be a, well, in fact, we'll see in a moment that this is a divergent diagram. The reason for that is that this uh, electron propagator is effectively 1 over p. This is 1 over p, 1 over p squared, but you're integrating d4 with p. Now, it's actually much better than that. The divergence is logarithmic because of some cancellations. But um, essentially, that's what we're almost doing. Now, before going on there, let me just do some sort of fancy bookkeeping that um, that um, is, is, is more motivational than computational. So you don't need to have this All right, so the idea is that the true photon propagator will be the lowest order photon propagator plus this term, plus this term iterated and so forth. And this is written as delta plus delta, that's this propagator. This thing is called pi star delta plus here we have a delta pi star, delta, pi star, delta, pi star, delta. The star on the pi means that it's this, uh, that it's this diagram here um, basically uh, such that it can't be cut by um, a single, by cutting, it can't be disconnected by cutting a single photon line. In other words, the reason why this isn't already included here is that this term can be cut by one photon line. So this is a connected diagram. So this is more complicated than that. And in fact, this is the lowest order contribution to that. To, to pi star, let us say. And I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm writing as a diagram, I'm, I'm using this to represent pi star. All right. Now, what you can see is you can rewrite that as delta 1 plus pi star delta plus pi star delta squared plus dot dot dot. And then, using the graduate student's friend identity, this is 1 over 1 minus pi star delta. Right. Now, the point of all that is that what we wanted, what we're sure of about the photon propagator is that the photon is massless, so it has a pole at, at q squared equal to 0. We don't want that screwed up. So we don't want this to do anything funny when q squared is 0. The way we fix that is we have pi star uh, of 0 equal to 0. So pi star of 0 is 0. And this is our lowest order diagram for pi star. All right, now, let me get it. So pi star is like a function of all of these four or I guess both of these four momenta, or one four momentum, or what is zero? Pi star is just a function of Q. Okay. Do we assume that it's that the product of pi star times delta is less than one? And is that is that a safe? Assumption? I want pi. St well, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's safe. That's symbolic. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, it is. In the sense that uh, pi. It should have an e squared, 
which is 1 over 137. And delta should be 1 over Q squared, essentially. I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, I think I'm going to assign this as a homework problem. Um, it's, and let me say what pi star is. So pi star is going to be basically this diagram without these two propagators, because you see we write the thing as we put in the propagators explicitly. So using the five rules one can uh, and, and let me say here, when I say the Feynman rules, uh, I mean Weinberg's version of it, because I'm following Weinberg here. You have here pi star rho sigma of Q, and this is one loop, is then a minus sign. The minus sign is because you have a fermion loop. I think, remember last semester we said that if we have a diagram of the fermion loop, you get an extra minus sign. So it's a minus sign, d fourth p, and then there's a trace. And now if you follow this trace, there's a minus i over 2 pi to the fourth, minus i p slash, this is the Feynman rule for this leg up here, divided by p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon and then 2 pi to the fourth e gamma rho minus i over 2 pi to the fourth minus i e slash minus q slash plus m over P minus Q squared plus M squared minus I epsilon, 2 pi to the 4, P down to sigma. Okay. So this part is this fermion propagator, and the other two things are these two vertices, each of which brings in a factor of E gamma yeah. Okay. So that's our that's what we want to compute. And with a little bit of cancellation, this is minus i e squared over 2 pi to the fourth integral e fourth p. And now this trace of minus i p slash plus m gamma rho minus i p slash minus q slash plus m gamma sigma divided by, and now two propagated factors, p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon p minus q squared plus m squared minus i All right, so that's, um, that's where you get in fact, that's certainly where people got when they were first doing uh, vacuum polarization. Well, that's a little bit historic and <coughs> false because when they first did vacuum polarization, they didn't have this nice formalism due to define them. But they got essentially a clumsier version of this expression, and they realized that there were these various divergences and then started to worry about it. Schwinger and Feynman and Dyson basically figured, oh, and also a Japanese physicist, Kaminaga, figured out the, the way to do this visualization. Okay, well, one of Feynman's many tricks was this deceptively simple integral formula. All right. 
Right, so that's, actually it's not that hard to do it. You can do it with your fingers. Okay, if you do that, what you can do is you can combine these two denominators. And in other words, you said A equal to this, B equal to that, and you rewrite this thing. Um, let me Uh, let's see. In other words, you write 1 over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon 1 over p minus q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. You write that as um, an integral 0 to 1 and it's dx over big square, and that square is p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. This is a times 1 minus x, so that's this term, plus x times p minus q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon squared. And um, one can rewrite that, of course, just by a little bit of algebra. It's dx over, and now it's p minus qx squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, and then plus q squared x times 1 minus x squared. All right. So it's So that's, um, that's the expression for simply the product of these two guys. And so altogether, this pi thing, which is equal to this, is then equal to minus i e squared over the fourth. Oh, wait a second. Before, before uh, going to that step, notice that what you can do here is you displace p you replace p by p plus qx, and then this simplifies. Of course, you have to also do that in the numerator. So you get a certain simplification. Um, there's a caveat here. None of these, uh, the Feynman trick is probably OK. But this shift of p goes to p plus qx is only valid if the integral is really suitably convergent. And so, in a sense, we're, into, we're, we're, we're anticipating the use of dimensional regularization to regularize the integrals, and then we can make this shift, p goes to p plus qx. All right, so then this is minus i e squared 2 pi to the fourth, integral 0 to 1 dx, integral d4 p, and then we've got a trace. All right, now this is a complicated trace. Um, minus i p slash plus q slash x plus m down a row. I think I'm going to write it this way minus i p slash minus q slash 1 minus x plus m and a sigma. All right, it's back over plus m squared minus i epsilon plus q squared x 1 minus x squared. Okay, so you see this denominator now is much simpler. So you made the shift, right? We made the shift. And um, these traces, of course, we know how to calculate these traces. Um, the trace of gamma mu is zero. 
the trace of gamma mu gamma nu is proportional to eta mu nu, and so forth. Um, let me evaluate the trace. I'll just say what the trace is. Trace of what's up there is equal to four minus p plus q x rho p minus q one minus x sigma plus p plus q x dot p minus q one minus x uh, eta rho sigma minus p plus q x sigma p minus q one minus p. p minus q one minus x rho plus p squared eta rho sigma. Okay, so that's the trace. Of course, four is that linear integer that occurs when you do these traces. All right. Let's look at where the poles are here. Remember, we're using um, Weinberg's metric, also Weinberg's gamma matrices. They differ from the pest controller by gamma matrices have an I to get the metric to switch. And uh, the P has minus sign on P0, minus P0 squared plus P vector squared. Okay. So what is that thing? That thing is minus P0 squared plus P vector squared plus m squared minus i epsilon plus q squared x one minus x. Now we've said a lot about minus i epsilon. In fact, we wasted an awful lot. Of, I think so. We used an awful lot of neuron time talking about minus i epsilon. But in all the tree level diagrams we did last semester, it was never relevant. We always just erased it. Here it plays a role. Because where are the poles in this Feynman diagram? Well, they're at P0 equal to plus or minus the square root of P vector squared plus M squared. So that's something that's positive for sure. Plus Q squared X 1 minus X. Uh, well, Q squared could have either sign. And then minus I epsilon. So, when this quantity here is positive, then it's, then the pole is here. It's just right below the real axis. And it has a companion pole minus that. The other end. On the other hand, let's think about the case where suppose this is large and negative, then um, and let's see, I hadn't thought about that until it just, just occurred to me as unless there's some reason why. Did anybody see why these are the only poles? Why it you can't have Q squared such that, oh, all right, he's, he's, he's working for, a, but he's looking at a particular case. We're talking about minus Q squared less than 4M squared, and um, that's interesting. That's, in other words, we're below the threshold for the production of an electron-positron pair. And so for that case, um, you can show that um, this, this, that this quantity here is always positive. So we're consider an x across it between zero and one. So we're considering, um, we're considering that case. All right, so let's, let's then assume that we've got these two poles here. Now, we've got this d fourth p integration but we've got the minus p0 squared, we've got the poles and everything. Well, the Italian ph the theoretical physicist Wick suggested, why don't we just 
rotate this contour. Instead of integrating along here, let us take advantage of the fact that we can add a ghost contour up here and um, down here, and a ghost contour there, and the whole thing is zero, and so we can replace this contour with that contour. Um, that's assuming that these are really ghost contours, that this integral is zero. Um, and we're talking about the P0 integration. And um, it, this P0 integration, well, you've really got P0 to the fourth down here. And um, this thing is at most P0 squared up there. So that, that, that looks plausible. If not, you can appeal to Regularization and say it's going to be finite, <coughs> so we're okay. All right, so we we've switched and done this wick rotation, which will cancel this I here. How do you appeal to dimensional regularization, and how do you do that? We haven't gotten to that yet. I'm going to do dimensional regularization in a minute, but nonetheless, okay. Yeah, I got one. Yeah, you got one. <laughs> All right. So, what is this thing equal to? Well, it's then 4e squared over 2 pi to the fourth integral 0 to 1 dx. Integral, and now we're doing d fourth p, and I'm putting an e here for Euclidean. And now it's this miserable trace which I wrote down. Um, but now in this trace, everything has changed to um, to, uh, in other words, P0 has been replaced by, let me um, get the, 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 in other words, P0 is minus I P4 or effectively, we're integrating here. In fact, why don't I be explicit? We're integrating here pp1, pp2, pp3, pp4. And um, p4 is equal to i p0. And um, q4 is i q0. And so now, this thing is this trace, which is minus p plus q x rho p minus q 1 minus x sigma plus p plus q x dot p minus q 1 minus x eta rho sigma. My, and these are all now Euclidean dot products. So in other words, we have A dot B is equal to sum A I B I from 1 to 4. Space-time indices on these p's over here, to your left. Yeah. Still, we have too many, too many of them. <laughs> well, we're we're letting p zero be minus i p four. I think shouldn't they run from zero to three? I mean, shouldn't it be zero one two three or one two three four? I'm confused by. Seems like we have five space-time indices. P one two three are the space ones. Okay. We haven't screwed with them. We used to have P zero, real. We've set P zero to be I P four. 
So are we defining P4? Yes. Okay. And P4 All right. is I P0. Yeah, right. And so we let P4 be I P0. And so we and, and that means then that we've got in those dot products we've got we've got a We've got two P4, we've got P4, Q4 is minus P0, Q0. So we've effectively preserved the thing. And then, yeah, we're integrating up, we're integrating here. Um, we're letting P0, which was real, become imaginary, so now P4 is real. We're integrating P4 and the I came out and canceled the over. Okay, now, here's where the dimensional regularization comes in. And this was invented um, in uh, 1972, or let us say published in 1972 by Wolf and uh, Veltman. And uh, Veltman was the senior person, but Wolf was a very bright graduate student. I don't know what it is in the milk or cheese in Holland, but they, this guy Veltman produced some very remarkable graduate students. Veltman and Wolf shared the Nobel Prize a few years ago for dimensional regularization and some of the things they did with it. Um, the good thing about it is that it's a method of regularization that doesn't screw around with gauge invariance and uh, it, it can be carried through for non-abelian theories as well as abelian theories. So in other words, when Schwinger and Feynman did their regularization, they were very careful not to screw up gauge invariance, but they were only dealing with QED, which is what we're doing now. And then Tupton and Belfin uh, invented this. All right, now here's the, here's the deal. Instead of um, integrating over, instead of doing this problem in four dimensions, we're going to do the problem in D dimensions. And uh, you can see right away that if you let D be 4 minus epsilon or better 3 minus epsilon, you're not going to have any divergences. And then the divergences recur as you let D go to 4. Now let me get some um, notes here that I made on this. All right, just to say what it is we're going to be doing. Okay, so first of all, E4 PE, we're going to be replacing that by omega sub D, kappa to the D minus 1 D kappa. I'm following Weinberg perhaps too closely. He's, his symbolic powers are so great that sometimes his notation leaves something to desire. Omega D is the area of a unit sphere in D dimensions. And that turns out to be 2 pi to the D over 2 over gamma of half D D over 2. Let me remind you, if you've forgotten what the gamma function is, it's an integral e to the minus x x to the z minus 1 dx, and it's z minus 1 factorial, which is another way of thinking about it. You can show that it has the uh, rule that z gamma of z is gamma of z plus 1. And um, 0 factorial, then, would be gamma of 1, 
and you see gamma of 1 is pretty simple. It's integral 0 to infinity. Sorry. P to the minus x, z is 1, so this is that, and that's 1. So that tells us what 0 factorial is. And similarly, 1 factorial is gamma of 2, which is also 1. Since gamma of 2 is 1 times gamma of 1, we know gamma of 1 is 1. And then um, 2 factorial, of course, is 2, and then gamma of 3, and so on. So gamma on the integers is pretty simple. It's just um, gamma of n is n minus 1 factorial. OK. Um, gamma on these, on, on off the integers, well, you just have to do the integral. And um, <coughs> there are some tricks. Uh, namely, gamma half is square root of pi, gamma of three halves is square root of pi over two. Okay, that's those are the two that we need in order to figure out what these spheres are, spherical areas are. For example, omega three, which would be the surface area of a sphere in three dimensions. Well, that's two pi to the 3 halves divided by gamma of 3 halves. And so that's 2 pi to the 3 halves divided by the square root of pi over 2, using that result over there. And that gives us 4 pi, which is reassuring. Um, unit sphere, so radius 1. And um, somewhat a less familiar result is the radius, is the area of a sphere, a unit sphere in four space dimensions, which is then 2 pi squared over gamma of 2. And we've seen that gamma of 2 is just 1, and so the answer is just 2 pi squared. All right, so that's, um, so the first, oh, and kappa, I'm sorry, I didn't say what kappa is. Kappa is the square root of p squared. So in other words, this is simply a Euclidean integration, d fourth, it's d, p1, p2, p3, p4. And so this is four vector p, the Euclidean four vector p, it has a length, which is just the sum of all the squares. We call that p squared. And kappa is um, square root of p squared. So it's basically the length of all right, so what you do then in dimensional regularization is you just pretend you're doing these things in d dimensions and you use these various formulas. One of them is d fourth p goes to omega d, the surface area of the sphere, and then um, k kappa to the, or effectively, I don't know, one could have just called this p to the d minus 1 dp. I think that would have been just as clear, p being the length of p. So I think I'm going to change that. P to the cap, P to the D minus one DP. Um, and then, then uh, if we have D fourth P, uh, say P nu, P nu, well, this goes to integral omega D, the surface area. This then goes to P squared M nu nu. Well, that makes sense because if, if, if you have p1, p2, and, you're, and that's all you're integrating, then, uh, uh, in other words, the rest of the thing is just a function of p squared, then um, uh, p1, p2 would integrate to 0. Just as the integral of p1 would be 0. But, uh, and so you get an eta mu nu, but it's actually eta mu nu over d, and then p to the d minus 1 pp. Okay. So that's, that's how that goes. And then a similar result for integral d4 p, <coughs> p mu, p nu, p rho, p sigma. Well, again, this is going to vanish unless these guys pair off. In other words, if it's 
P1, P1, P2, P2, fine. But if it's P1, P2, P3, P4, you get zero. Or if it's P1, Q, P2, zero. Um, and so what you get then is omega d, which I'll remind you is this expression over here. And remember, this gamma function can uh, blow up. And in particular, if gamma, if z is 0, you have a pole because you have 1 over x dx. And then if you also have poles when uh, z is negative, is negative in so this is omega d p to the d minus 1 dp. And then this turns out to be p to the fourth, because there are four p's, of course. And then you get eta mu nu, eta rho sigma, plus eta mu rho, eta, sorry, eta mu sigma, plus eta mu sigma, and the other factors, eta mu sigma. And that's to be divided by d times d plus 2. And you can verify that this is the right result when d is 4. OK. So that's, that's all notes there. Now, done that, then this huge integral here, and of course the complexity of this integral is because of the damn trace, which is essentially, I don't want to say trivial, but it's, there's no mystery associated with the trace. I think it's just complicated. And uh, by the way, one of the things Veltman's group did is they developed computer programs to do Feynman diagram. So they were, that's, I guess, in fact, it's probably true. I don't know the history really, but it's probably true that they discovered dimensional regularization as a byproduct of writing these computer programs to do the integrals. And they, well, I, don't, I don't know. It might have been just one of the books to play on the OK, well, in this case, then, this thing does, it turns into the following. 4e squared omega d over 2 pi to the 4. Maybe I should say, rather than equal sign, an arrow. We're dimensionally regularizing this. Integral 0 to 1 dx. Integral 0 to infinity. p to the d minus 1 dp. Over p squared plus m squared plus q squared x one minus x squared. Okay, now we've got these things in the numerator, and some of these things simplify because uh, this 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 quantity times that it's going to be essentially an eta rho sigma. So what we get is minus 2p squared eta rho sigma over d plus 2 q rho q sigma x 1 minus x plus p squared minus q squared x 1 minus x eta rho sigma plus m squared eta rho sigma. Okay, so it's that expression at this stage. All right, well, Weinberg gives us the integral form. Wait a minute, there's something stupid here. This is eta rho sigma. Okay, we use these integral formulas, 0 to infinity, p to the d minus 1 over p squared plus mu squared squared dp 
is one half nu squared the d over 2 minus 2 gamma to the d over 2 gamma to the 2 minus d over 2. So that's, um, I must say that surprises me. I had no idea that this sort of an integral, which looks fairly tame and doesn't seem to have anything to do with the gamma function, should be a product of gamma function. Also, 0 to infinity p to the d plus 1 over p squared plus nu squared squared dp is 1 half nu squared to the d over 2 minus 1 gamma 1 plus d over 2 gamma of 1 minus d over 2. Okay, so these are two integral formulas which one can then use to do these integrals. And what you see is we've got something of this form. E squared nu, nu squared here is m squared plus q squared x, 1 minus x. Uh, we have then p to the d minus 1. And so for the case of this term and that term and that term, we just use the upper integral. For the case of this term and this term, we use this integral. And if we do that, what we get, maybe I can write it here, but it's got enough space. We have 2e squared omega d over 2 pi to the fourth, integral 0 to 1 x. By the way, in the days back when I was a graduate student, the part that was hard in um, doing one of these calculations was the integral 0 to 1 dx. It was before Mathematica made so Although I have found errors in x in maple by the way. Have any of you guys found errors in that? Never. Huh? Never. Usually it's an input error. <laughs> well, that's good. Because, um... Okay, so let's, um, let me just give what the answer is here. Uh, we get m squared plus q squared x one minus x d over 2 minus 1, the gamma of 1 plus d over 2. This, these are re irreducibly complicated. Um, Alright, this is 2 q rho q sigma um, x 1 minus x minus q squared, eta rho sigma. These notes are online, right? Xerox the book and made a PDF of the, of the notes. And I'll put my, the extra pages that I added uh, in. Okay, it's that times m squared plus Q squared x one minus x to d over two minus two, and then this is times gamma of d over two gamma of two minus d over two. All right, so this is let's just review it. It's something out in front. The e squared that I promised would save us back there. An omega d surface area and sphere d dimensions, and then an integral from zero to one, and you've got all you've got basically two terms, and the two terms come because you have things in the numerator inside the square bracket that are either p squared or p to the zero. And now um, 
Weinberg uses a magic identity, 1 minus 2 over d, gamma to the 1 plus d over 2, gamma to the 1 minus d over 2, is minus gamma d over 2, gamma to 2 minus d over 2. simplifies considerably and we have then pi star rho sigma of q equal to 40 squared omega d over 2 pi to the fourth gamma d over 2 gamma 2 minus d over 2 and then q rho q sorry q rho Q sigma minus Q squared eta rho sigma and then times an integral 0 to 1 dx. <coughs> X 1 minus, minus X M squared plus Q squared X 1 minus X to the D over 2 minus 2. Okay. So that's what we've got. And let me just rewrite this. This is D over 2. All right, now this looks harmless. Um, this integral is fine. Um, in fact, it's almost trivial if you take, uh, if you just let D go to 4, because this becomes 0, and that becomes 1. But if you let d go to 4, this becomes gamma of 0, and gamma of 0 is singular. So because of this singularity, uh, that's, where the that's where the infinity is at this point. In other words, we haven't yet gotten rid of the infinity. We've just regularized the thing, the, 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 the integration. We've regularized the integrals by going D dimension. And we can think of D as complex, by the way. So what, what does regularize works with D being complex? Mean, what? What do you mean by regularize? Regularize means you take something that's singular and you reinterpret it, you represent it by a quantity that's finite. So in other words, this integral that we've been computing is logarithmically divergent. Or actually, it's a, it actually, I think it actually has a pole. Well, no, I think it is a log divergent. Anyway, it's divergent. But if we do the, the whole calculations in, instead of four dimensions, four minus epsilon dimensions, then it's fine. So we've regularized. And the reason we want to do that is that now we're going to go back and use these other terms, these counter terms, Interpret them in terms of dimensional regularization, subtract the infinite part, and we'll have a finite part left over. That'll be the result. Okay. Now, before going, before doing that though, let's notice something that is very nice about this. Namely, Q rho pi star rho sigma of Q is zero. Because if you multiply by Q rho, you get Q squared Q sigma, and then you multiply by Q rho, Q lower rho, you get Q upper sigma, and so the two cancel. All right. Now why is why is it that we wanted that? Well, that's another bit of uh, physics that was not in. It's it's Weinberg covers this in chapter ten, but. He does things in such generality there that I thought that I would just extract the essence of it and give you the bottom line so that you appreciate why this is true. Although you can see that it's, it's, it's effectively current conservation. 
All right, so for example, let me just define something called mu. Integral d fourth x e to the minus i q x j mu of x. So what do we expect? What we expect here is q mu m mu of q. This is equal to d fourth x. And this, let me just write things down. This is i d mu of e to the minus i q x j mu of x. Now, if we integrate by parts, drop the surface term, what we get is minus i d fourth x e to the minus i q x d mu j mu of x. And this is zero by current. More generally, if we have two of these, m mu nu, and now q and q prime, integral d fourth x, d fourth x prime, e to the minus i q x, minus i q prime, x prime, time ordered product of j mu of x, j nu of x prime, Now what I want to show is the Q nu, M mu nu of Q and Q prime. Well, by the same token, let me just skip. I mean, what we would have here is we bring in a Q mu. That's the same as, uh, I guess, I d, dx mu. And so this thing is equivalent to minus I d fourth x d fourth x prime e to the minus i q x minus i q prime x prime d mu might as well bring it in there time ordered product j mu of x j mu of x prime okay. all right this j mu is the current corresponding to what ah uh, uh, oh, brilliant Uh, J mu is the electromagnetic current, and so J mu, I mean, more generally, it's the electromagnetic current, but effectively, this is E psi bar gamma mu psi at X. Okay. And we have current conservation, J mu, J mu. All right, now, this time-ordered product <coughs> is, of course, theta of x0 minus x0 prime, j mu x, j mu x prime, plus theta of x0 prime minus x0, j nu of x prime, j mu of x. We now differentiate it, what we get is d mu t of j mu x mu, j mu x prime equals, well, if the derivative hits the j mu, we get zero, if it hits the j mu over here, we get zero. If it hits the theta function, we get a delta function, because the theta function is the heavy side function, and you differentiate that, and what you get is just zero everywhere else. Okay? So this turns out to be, in fact, let me just waste forward space. This is then delta of x0 minus x0 prime, j mu of x, j nu of x prime, minus delta of x0 prime minus x0, J mu of x prime, J mu of x. And actually, I, I, I've made a, there was a mistake in the notes. This should be a J0, because, and the reason is that um, if this is a space derivative, there's no big deal because the theta function only involves time. So it's only the mu equal to zero component that gives you this. 
And so this gives us delta of x0 minus x0 prime. Remember, the delta function is even. So this is just the commutator of j0 of x with j0 of x. Okay. Now, what is this commutator? Well, you can notice that it's an equal time commutator. You can imagine integrating this over spatial x. Then it becomes the charge operator. Okay. So what is the charge operator? The charge operator commuting with some, something like g nu of x prime would be, apart from a, it'd be proportional to the charge of this thing, the charge carried by the current times j nu of x prime. It would be effectively like that. But the charge carried car car by the current is zero because it's neutral current. In other words, it's um I'm gonna say it's I guess um, one can say that it's um, well. Let's see. This was obvious to me when I was writing this down, and so I forgot to ask myself why it's really neutral. Um, Well, I mean, if, if, if you forget about the positrons, what is it? It's a creation operator for the electron times a, an annihilation operator for the electron, and then there'll be the other terms of the positron. So this lowers the charge by one, raises it by one, or rather, actually raises it and lowers. So the effect is neutral. Anyway, the point is that this is zero, and so this commutator is zero. That means then, that when you have one of these structures, a time-ordered product of, of neutral currents, Fourier transform and so forth, function then of these Q's, it is um, something such that if you multiply by Q mu, you expect to get zero. Okay. That is what we found out is true for our pi. Now, in what sense is pi this uh, sort of a structure. Well, pi is the amplitude for one photon to become another photon. And if you um, imagine that as a Feynman diagram, well, what would you have? You'd have an a mu, j mu, and then you'd have an a nu, j nu, and then you'd have this thing being time order. Okay, so this is, um, in fact, if you want, you put in the so this is our, these are the two interaction Hamiltonians. And then you have a state here of, say, one photon. And then you have another, well, it's Q, isn't it? And then you have maybe Q prime here, but it's, it's you can expect a delta of Q minus Q prime. Okay, well, this thing here annihilates the Q. This thing creates the Q prime. And so what you've got then for this amplitude of this pi star is really the mean value in the vacuum of time ordered product of two currents. With, of course, these various e to the minus i, q dot. Okay, so, so um, what we wound up with, so, so in other words, this pi star is effectively an m mu nu, or an m rho sigma, and we expect that dotting it into q, we should get zero, and that's what's actually happened. And that's one of the reasons why people like dimensional regularization, is that you automatically get this feature here. All right, I think this dimensional regularization is a big topic, so I'm not ashamed that I haven't gotten through it all in one lecture. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, I'll um, start at this point, I'll 
review what dimensional regularization is, and then we'll subtract the counter terms and uh, get a finite result and interpret. All right, any questions? So what is this based on and who tells us that the limit of taking uh, time, the dimensions, that is continuously varying the dimension will keep the thing continuous. I mean, what is this based on and what, what tells us that this thing will work? I mean like, how do you know that the thing is supposed to go continuously in the variable dimension? The, the integral. Why is dimensional rate? Why did, why is dimensional regularization dimensional regularization a good regularization? Yeah. Well, the proof of the pudding is what I just gave you. That's part of the proof. But the other reason is just intrinsically, what are you doing? You, you see, let, let's look at what the other kinds of regularization were. I mean, what might you do now? You can regulate. You've got this integration here. What would you do? Well. You'd cut off the p integration at high p. Well, putting the cutoff introduces, I mean, that's, that, that, that introduces problem, putting in the cutoff. Or you could, you could say, um, you're going to add a term here, um, 1 plus p squared over some large mass squared. That would also, you, you, you risk, if, if you do something naive like that, the natural thing, you're, you're running into the possibility of ruining gauge invariance or something else, or giving the photon a mass. So this, this thing, really just, it, it, it essentially just focused on this part, okay, which leaves the propagators and the gammas and everything else invariant, and just sort of, just, just changes the dimension of space-time. And it, it's a way of, basically it's a way of regularizing that respects the, the symmetries of the theory. Now, it, that, that's not obvious initially, but we've seen an indication at this point. At least it didn't ruin current conservation. And is this step of going into Euclidean space? Uh, oh, the Euclidean space, that's something else again. The Euclidean space was done way back in the probably the 50s. So to get this, uh, this kind of uh, thing over here, you, you have to do that kind of analysis. Yeah, yeah, this is called a wick rotation. and wick probably wrote that down in the 50s or even the 40s. What's the difference between wick rotation and analytic continuity? Is that basically the same thing? You, you, can, you can kind of think about going to from... Well, you, you, you're using the analyticity of the, uh, of the integrand as a function of P0. And you're saying you just have poles here so you can rotate the conflict. sometimes extend it to um, a much larger region. This is just a case where you've got an integration along here, and obviously that's sort of a problem. You've got these two damn poles that you have to go around and so forth. And moreover, um, even when you do it, you've got an indefinite metric here. So, I mean, you had it over here. It's gone there. So, you, so by doing this rotation, you just have a p squared. Then you're in you once you're in Euclidean space. Well, you always went to Euclidean space. That was always done, at least in all modern treatments, 1950s, 1960s. I mean, when Feynman, in other words, wrote down the Feynman rules and showed people how to do various diagrams, including one loop diagrams, he did he did this. What he didn't do was the dimensional regularization. That was. 20 years later. And the, 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 the regularization that Schwinger and Feynman used was good enough to keep
QED but not true on the BJC. And of course, any regularization is just a mathematical trick because uh, nobody knows what's really going on. In Although it's possible that the dimensional regularization is really telling us something about what's going on. So can it be that I, if I move from uh, one side or the other side of the dimension, that is go from 3 plus epsilon or 4 minus epsilon, uh, that is 4 plus epsilon or 4 minus epsilon? Well, 4 plus epsilon is even worse than 4. Yeah, so if, uh, so although, although and, and, as, as you're sort of pointing out, if this is if this thing is 4 plus epsilon, then at least you're not hitting the pole, so maybe it is okay at 4 yes, plus epsilon. So I, I, I find that bizarre, but apparently it's all right. No, I'm just saying that, I mean, it is some variable which I'm trying to move to, towards or away from, right? So if I, if I take the limits from both the sides, oh, it you're be asking, is this thing analytic? Well, the gamma function is certainly an analytic function. Yes. So you probably have analyticity in, in D. So the, is that what is that the idea of regularization? I think you I think you've just discovered something. Yes, one of the nice things about dimensional regularization is that it promotes it changes the dimension of space time of Euclidean space time from four to a complex D, and the the the. Uh, result is then an analytic function of D, it's some product of these gamma functions. That's all that was. Right. So that's, that's an important option there. Here you, 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 you get it.